Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 15. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Behrens, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. In this episode, we interview Dr. Patricia L. Bryan, co-author of Midnight Assassin, A Murder in America's Heartland, published by the University of Iowa Press. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden, from the origins of the doggerel, Lizzie Borden took an axe, to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents an interview with Dr. Patricia Bryan. here today to welcome Dr. Patricia L. Bryan. She is the Henry P. Brandeis Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where she has taught class classes in federal income tax and a seminar in law and literature. She has degrees from Carleton College, a BA, the University of Iowa, a JD, and the New York University a master's in tax. She has been a visiting professor at Stanford Law School and the University of Iowa College of Law. Brian is the co-author of Midnight Assassin, a murder in America's heartland, which is the subject of our talk today, and the co-editor of Her America, a collection of stories by Susan Glassbell. Brian has written and spoken extensively about Glassbell's work. She has investigated several criminal cases from the 19th century and has published articles about them in the Stanford Law Review and the Annals of Iowa. She and her husband have a new book coming out this July from the University of Iowa Press. The book involves another true crime from the 19th century and is entitled The Plea, the true story of young Wesley Elkins and his struggle for redemption. Welcome, Dr. Bryan. Thank you, Stephanie. I read nice your book, Midnight yes. Assassin, very, very, and enjoyed it immensely. If one can enjoy reading a book about the ordeals of others, I must say. Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the murder that this book is about, the Hossack murder, and Susan Glassbill's connection to it, which is most fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, you're right. It's a book about a terrible crime. Um, and the crime occurred in December of 1900. Um, John Hasek, who was 59 years old, was killed, murdered with an ax while he slept in bed. And the his wife, Margaret Hasek, um, was sleeping next to him, according to what she claimed. Sleeping next to him, she was on the outside of the bed, and she, the murderer would have had to reach over her to strike her husband. He was struck twice with the ax, once with the sharp end and once with the blunt end, um, and he did not die right away. He lived until morning. He never identified his attacker. Um, Margaret Hasek said when she talked to investigators that she heard a noise, she called up to her children. There were five of them sleeping upstairs. They came down. She said, something is a matter with Pa. This is according to the children's testimony and her testimony. And they all went into the bedroom and found John Hasek with his head basically broken open. Um, the children ran for the doctor. The investigators clay came later that day. Neighbors came to the house. Um, according to the doctor and to the children and the neighbors, Margaret Hasek sat by her husband 
um, throughout the night and held his hand until he died. The investigators arrived fairly soon after the murder and the county attorney fairly quickly focused on Margaret Hasek as the main suspect. Um, there was no evidence of an intruder. There was nothing taken from the house. Fairly quickly, the family ax was discovered um, close to the house under a shed nearby. It had what looked like blood, what looked like human hairs, although you know, forensic evidence was really not collectible at the time, and many people had handled the ax. So it wasn't clear that it was the murder weapon, although seemed fairly likely. Um, Margaret Hasek at the inquest was questioned and again, she claimed she was innocent throughout the ordeal. What really convinced the prosecutors and the county attorney, however, was the evidence from the neighbors, the testimony from the neighbors that Margaret Hasek had been abused, um, had been threatened by her husband, had lived in fear of him. Um, he had said that he would kill her. She had run to the neighbors asking for help. Um, they had nothing to offer. Um, had told her to go back home, that family trouble should be kept private. Um, it was the evidence of motive and circumstantial evidence. You know, her story was difficult to believe that she had been sleeping next to him and had not felt the axe at all, had not been awakened by these blows. Um, and again, suspicion fell on her right away. She was actually arrested as she left her husband's gravesite after the burial. She was tried in um, the spring of 1901, and she was convicted by the nine men on the jury. Um, and of course, at that time, only men could be on the jury. The lawyers were men, the judge was a man. Um, Margaret Hostick never admitted that she had been abused. You know, whether she was telling the truth seems unlikely, um, or whether she knew that that would only be counted against her. Um, she was retried the next year, and she did go to prison after she was convicted. She was retried the next year in a different venue, and the jury um, couldn't decide. It was a hung jury. And she was um, let go, released from prison, and went home to Indianola, where her farm, where it was close to her farm, her farm had been auctioned off at that point, but lived quietly in her community until her death. Um, and no one else was ever really suspected or charged with the murder. So it is an enduring mystery. Hmm. Sounds like another enduring mystery. Yeah, another. Uh, <laughs> right. I'll but, say, yeah. uh, Stephanie, you asked about Susan Glaspell's connection. Susan Glaspell was a young reporter at the time. She was in her early 20s. She had graduated from Drake College, um, and there weren't many women at the time. She had graduated at the top of her class with a degree in philosophy. She wanted to be a writer. She went to work for the Des Moines Daily News, um, a very high profile newspaper, disappointed when she was assigned to the State House. Um, but not long after that, she was assigned to cover this very well publicized sensational murder um, in Indianola, Iowa. She went there and proved that her editors had been right in assigning her to it. She wrote fairly dramatic um, stories about it. You know, all the newspapers, no social media, of course, television, radio, um, the newspapers published um, stories that were designed to pull their readers in, and Susan Glaspell did not disappoint. Um, she covered the first trial she then left journalism um, soon after Margaret Hasek was convicted and went back to Davenport to devote herself to fiction. And it wasn't until 1916 um, that she wrote the play Trifles, which 
was inspired by Margaret Hasek's trial. There, there really is no doubt about that. I was, I, I've taught trifles and a short story written by Susan Glaspell in my law and literature class. And that's really how I became interested. Um, oh, that's wondered, interesting. Yeah. Well, I wondered why Susan Glaspell, who had no exposure to the criminal law, why she had such doubts about the criminal justice, the legal system's ability to do justice. I mean, a jury of her peers and trifles are the story of a woman who has been accused of murdering her husband. And the men go to investigate the murder, they're the authorities. And yet the women who are in the kitchen discover the real life of right. Minnie Wright, right. the accused woman. Right. And they judge her differently. Um, you know, they see that she has been abused. Um, whether they decide that she's justified in what she did or not, they do find evidence that she killed her husband. And again, whether they decide she's justified or whether they just see the men who are, you know, obviously demeaning of her and of many, um, very patriarchal, um, look down on the women, make disparaging comments throughout, um, and clearly have no interest in looking into many, the, sus the suspects, true life. And it seems when the women, you know, the women are excluded from the legal system and in a way they subvert the legal system by taking the evidence away, um, again, deciding, I think, that the men are incapable of understanding her life and so cannot do justice. So anyway, I was interested in why Susan Glaspell, who had, again, was not a lawyer, had such doubts about the legal system. So you started with Susan and went back to the story or did the murder yeah. pop up and then, oh, there's her name and I'm already interested in her. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, good question. It was the, which would it be, the egg? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the woman. <laughs> yeah, there was a story. Um, I, I, I taught the story. You know, when I started teaching law and literature, I looked at what are the things that are most taught in a law and literature class and all of them were by men of you course know, Shakespeare Camus of course um, you know Dickens except for this one story a jury of her peers by Susan Glasspool so of course I went right to that I had never heard of it um and she and was that she was yeah. in her in her writing as a journalist during the case I think you touch upon that in the beginning of her uh correspondence or uh, her um her reportage of the case she's following along with the story almost as if she is guilty and just telling the story and and the the line that is being fed to the press by the sheriff and the and the lawyers and the the judge you know those people and it's after she sees her in person it's after she experiences the trial that she sort of has this sort of awakening of, was she the only female reporter who's- Yeah. Yeah. She was. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I wondered what had inspired her. I went back, knew she was a reporter, went back to the newspapers in 1901 and it lists the reporter and Susie Glaspell. Susie. Um, <laughs> yeah, the one woman. And you're exactly right, Stephanie. She starts off when she gets there, sort of following the story as it's put forth by the press and the county attorney, um, which depicts Margaret Hasek as, you know, her steely eyes, her right. firm jaw and her masculine bearing. Um, and yeah, as you say, I, I think she changes both when she sees Margaret Hasek and then also we discovered that she traveled to the Hasek farm. Yes, yes. It visited the farmhouse. Yes. And I think the at that scene point, of the crime, yes. yes. Right. She was really struck by the 
difference between her life. You know, she's an independent, career-driven, um, a, a woman who sees this whole future ahead of her. The difference between her life and Margaret Hasek, who was an overworked farm wife, um, who was under the power of her husband. I mean, she had no money of her own. Mm -hmm. She worked so hard. I mean, one of the things we do in the book is really to give a sense of what yeah. life was like for women. It wasn't easy for men either, but for women, it was incredibly isolated and unrewarding. Well, the isolation is part of the major problem with poor Margaret's life, which is there's when she goes to neighbors to tell them what's happening to her and to ask them to save her from this man, the reaction is, well, we don't get involved in each other's problems. This is a right. private matter. And there's this sort of code of family privacy that she's breaching, which is uh, unattractive for them right. to see her that way, even though she's asking for help. The help is hardly granted, um, but then they knew, though, that stuff was going on in there. They knew things were happening in that house and yet did nothing against him, but sort of watched him a little bit. But she got no assistance. It, it, exactly right. And about a year before the murder, she had attempted to escape. She had apparently gone through an upstairs window and run in the rain to a neighbor's house. Right. And the response of the neighbor was to gather other men and to take her home and to tell her and the children that they did, the neighbors did not want to hear any more right. from her. And right. what's interesting too, is that they said, you must reconcile with your husband. Oh, and that was the whole thing at the trial. She kept claiming we had reconciled. We had reconciled exactly because she didn't want the motive of the abuse to slap her in the face and create this this problem. So she just kept saying, "No, we had reconciled the year before. When they told yeah. us to reconcile, we reconciled. We were fine." And then everybody testified, "Yep, they reconciled. Everything was good." And they kept using that word. Yes. As if it had the power to say she didn't hate her husband. Right. <laughs> you know, and and like, she, yeah, exactly. And she transformed. Yes, you know, she, yes. she was the dutiful wife at that and, point and made a happy home for her husband. Well, the other know? thing was at the trial, it was noted that she had her family around her. Oh, they allowed the children, all of them, to sit around her at the table, at the defense table. Unheard of today, of course. But Susan got to see that she was not. Um, shunned by her children in this ordeal. She was embraced. And didn't she have one child with their head in her lap, like most of the time? And Yeah, that, yeah, that was the second trial. She held her grandchild, yeah. um, which, as you say, would not be allowed no. um, today, and presented this image of a, she was frail, during her second trial wow. and presented the picture of a woman who was loved by her children mm -hmm. and her children testified for her. Right. Um, you know, their story of that night was consistent with hers. Right. Yeah. So, so this is called a lot of cases where there is an ax or a hatchet involved. They call it like the Lizzie Borden of Paris or the Lizzie Borden of California. But this one is actually the Lizzie Borden of Iowa, right. which is interesting because Lizzie Borden's uncle, John Morse, who figures into the Lizzie Borden story, lived in Hastings, Iowa. And he lived there at this time, which I found that was interesting. He lived in Iowa. So um, so why is why the parallel? Why is you mentioned it in the book also? Um, I don't fault you for that at all, but there is this woman accused kind of um, theme in both cases without any evidence. Right. 
so what is a parallel? Why do we compare it to Lizzie Borden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I think part of what makes them similar is that there is this enduring mystery, um, yes. which leaves yeah. it up to, it can never be proof. There was no, there yes. were no witnesses. Um, and so, I mean, especially with Lizzie Borden, people have spun all kinds of theories um, about what happened. And with Margaret Hasek, certainly in the community, there are differing theories about, did she do it? Was she in a fugue state? And so really didn't remember what happened? Was it one of her sons? Another interesting parallel is that both of them were looked at fairly quickly as the main suspects. And there were, I mean, you know more about the Lizzie Borden case than I, but there were no, there was no evidence of an intruder. Right. Um, there was circumstantial evidence. And nothing against, was stolen. And nothing was stolen, right? It was a very violent way. Yes that the victims were killed. Um, an ax in both cases, I mean, poison was the more womanly way to kill, um, or that's what was said, you know, putting something in the food. An ax was an unusual way. And I think that certainly inspired a lot of interest. The thought that a woman who certainly you know, according to the true image of a woman, true notions of a woman would not be capable of wielding an ax. And yet she worked um, on a farm. So she was a farm wife who certainly had muscles, you know, she had muscles. She wasn't, you know, she did, she did a lot of heavy lifting in her life. So it's, uh, as opposed to Lizzie, who was sort of never worked a day in her life. Let's put it that way. I mean, right. Quite genteel compared to Elizabeth's life. Yeah. Right. I mean, Margaret Hasek was a farm woman, you know, right. hardened hands, big. She was 57 years old. Um, she had been married for 33 years. You know, both Lizzie and Margaret were accused of killing a sleeping man. I mean, oh yeah, man. there you go. Yeah. I didn't even think of that one. Yep. But I think that also inspired a certain um, amount of sensational you know, drama. Um, it, both of them had very suspect timelines. Yes. Um, they both, you know, always claimed they were innocent. And it's true. There were, was no clear forensic evidence. Right. Linking such them. a thing first, existed even in the first place, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's also interesting, the blood, because Lizzie had no blood um, on the clothes that were right. found. Um, the dress, she was, what, seen to be burning. Yes, a on dress Sunday, and, yes, after the murders. Yeah. And in Margaret's case, there was no blood on the front of her chemise. And in fact, but it was on the back, was it? Exactly. Exactly. And there was a chemise that they later found in a pail of water um, that people said they had seen some of the inquest jurors that had some spatters on the front, um, but it was destroyed as evidence. And they never oh. found blood on her clothes. And right, right you say blood on her back, which if she's lying of, beside him and he's attacked, then the blood would be on her back. Yeah. Could someone or, have attacked him from the foot of the bed? You no, know, it was on the side because... No, I mean, it could, he couldn't reach him from the foot of the bed, whoever attacked him. Uh, right. And and the axe, axe came oh, right Oh, the way down. it came down. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the other possibility as to blood on the back is that she someone else had come in, someone, one of her sons is another right. suspect, um, and she had her back turned. You know, that's what some people have hypothesized as to why, it, that it was not her, that she was in on it. And so that's why she could always say, I didn't do it. Exactly. I didn't do it. I didn't right. do it. Yeah. And so she's yeah. protecting someone else. 
that that's the idea. I mean, I think what's interesting too about Lizzie and um, Margaret is that in both cases, the defense really focused on the true image of a woman and her appearance and behavior. Yes, so yes. for Lizzie, yes. not so for Margaret, but it was hard in both cases for the defense to point to someone else. You know, that's what lawyers often try to do in a courtroom. They try to make up a story as to who else could have done it. Right. Um, and, you know, her uncle had an alibi. I mean, I think. You yes, know, a really, perfect alibi. So yeah. That, yeah. Right. The, the um, airtight. And right. so did her sister. Right. Bridget, I mean, Lizzie basically hadn't gave an alibi, not an alibi, but certainly didn't give incriminating evidence against Bridget. Nope. Um, nope. And in Margaret's case, the defense in the second trial. Why was she did, convicted, though? Why was Margaret convicted, but Lizzie was acquitted? I think, well, two reasons. I think that Margaret's story and Lizzie's also, but Margaret's especially was impossible to believe. You know, the notion that she was lying next to her husband um, and did not feel the acts. I think that the motive in Margaret's case was more clear than it was in Lizzie's case. Um, I mean, the neighbor's test testimony about the abuse, I think, was certainly contradictory to what Margaret said, because even during that year of the reconciliation, a few neighbors had heard of troubles. Um, and I do think that the defense had a harder time portraying Margaret. And you suggested this, Stephanie, when you said Margaret was a farm woman, she was heavy, she certainly had used an ax. Um, I think they had a much, the defense lawyers had a much harder time saying, you know, is she a fiend? She doesn't look like a fiend. How can you believe that she is guilty of murder? Um, and I mean, one other thing I'll just point out, I think that there was a lot of sympathy for John Hasek in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the prosecution played on that. Um, you know, well, he was a different man to, uh, to the people around him than he was inside his own home. I mean, that that's very typical, actually, of secluded families who are far away from other families what you never know what goes on behind closed doors and they could be upstanding citizens and um, uh, welcomed by the community and considered pillars of their community and then they go home and they're just miserable sons of guns so I feel, which is still true today yes right? so yeah. they pay their bills on time yeah you know, they can commute as, as susan glasswell puts it um, they're well respected. He ran for a political office, um, and, and you know it, it. It really is different. The men socialize in town; they're handling the money. Right. The women are at home doing these thankless chores. Yes. Cleaning the floors time after time when the men come in with their, you know, dirty feet doing the laundry. Um, dealing with the chickens, getting and no raising money. the children. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, They're five of them. <laughs> Goodness. Well, she had she had ten children um, with her last one when she was forty four years old. You know, just you imagine what her life was like. And of course, in those times, the children, as they grew, were expected to work on the farm right. and to help with the younger children. Um, so, and she was close to her children. That became clear during the trial. Is that what helped her with the hung jury? Was it the family sympathy? Do you think, why a hung jury the second time? And I know it was a technicality why she got her retrial. Um, the, but 
they hung and then they said, well, we're not going after anybody else because we know it's her, but that's just the way it's going to be, right? Why the hung jury, do you think? I think there are a couple of reasons. One, the defense was successful in um, getting a change of venue. And I think that was very important. Oh, that's right. I remember now. Yeah, Yeah, people didn't know John Hasek. um, And the prosecution really, the the prosecution really couldn't paint him in the same way. I think he came with the neighbors testifying that she had been abused. I think in the first trial that could be used as proving her motive. In the second trial, I think because John Hasek wasn't known as a well-respected pillar of the community, um, had the effect of drumming up sympathy for her in a different way than it did in the first. Um, I I think also Margaret Hasek had been in prison for a year. Um, She did look aged and frail. I think that, you know, it drew more sympathy from the audience. And I think also the women in the second trial played more of a part. Um, You know, they were just observers. But an interesting point, at one point in the middle of the trial, after the testimony had finished, a line of women went up to shake Margaret Hasek's hand. Um, You know, would not be allowed today, but I think that it really showed that the women were taking Margaret's side um, and felt she had suffered enough. Oh, maybe so. Maybe that's part of it. A year in jail and seeing how it debilitated her physically. And uh, yeah, it's not like she's going to kill anybody else, you know? No, although, you know, there were still... um, Four people, four men who, I think it was four, who felt she was guilty. I mean, it was not acquittal across the board. It was a hung jury. Right. So, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But she at least she swayed some everybody. people, right? Yeah. And it affected some people. And then you only need one, I think, in America, at least. And exactly so, right. So one you, person hung out. Yeah. Well, and there were more than one, but you only need one. That's right. You know, it's funny at the end of the trial with Lizzie Borden, when she was acquitted, they went away for probably an hour, but within 15 or 20 minutes, they had decided. And they just sort of hemmed and hawed with each other to make it look good that they at least thought about it. And then they came back and found her not guilty. And then later presented her with a very large photograph of them all seated. (sighs) And she hung it in her home at Maplecroft, apparently. So The jury felt like they were a part of her story in a positive way. Um, They used to have reunions while they were still alive and uh, meet at the Parker house and they would in New Bedford and um, recall the days, you know, and pass down their stories to their families of what it was like to sit in that hot jury room in New Bedford, Massachusetts for 13 days listening to this evidence when they obviously had already all made up their minds. And did the judge join them? Well, there's three judges in Massachusetts in a Superior Court murder case. So there were three judges (laughs) and uh, a ridiculous number of judges. They were trying to change the law beforehand, but it, it wasn't in time. So the judges, no, they did not. They went on to other kinds of careers, the lawyers. When you mentioned uh, the men, you said that there were there were men lawyers, there were men judges, there were men juries, there were also men police, and almost entirely men reporters. So here you have this patriarchal society, a rural patriarchal society, and then you have this woman in the middle of it saying I didn't do it I'm innocent and what stamina it must have taken for her with a straight face to these men because if she said she did it they might have went oh we understand but no she said I didn't do it and stood strong against everybody 
Right. It's amazing. It's amazing strength in her, I think. It, it, yes, I agree. And it, 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 her last words after the judge sentenced her, you know, the prosecution argued that she should be hung. Um, showing some degree of mercy, the judge sentenced her to hard labor in prison. And her last words were, before my God, I am not guilty of this crime. And, you know, because of that, of course, the defense could not argue that she was justified in what she did or that she had been acting in self-defense, even though she, you know, he was asleep at the time. And there was insanity. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 I mean, you can't you can't say either she's innocent or she, she was justified in what she did. Right. I mean, you're but, exactly- but women were not justified in killing their husbands. I mean, that was no. not a justification. So it's not like today where if a woman is abused, 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 and she kills him because she thinks he's going to kill her, then it's justified, justifiable homicide. But back then you were just supposed to take it. That was your marriage. I mean, there was no rape inside the, mer- the family also back then. Um, so violence against women within the home was, uh, uh, accepted. Yeah. It was just something you had to deal with and you had to reconcile. Exactly. And even today it's really, I mean, the battered woman defense is sort of thrown around as something that is commonly accepted, but it is really hard to prove. It is. Especially when the man is asleep and is not, <laughs> you know, this case, not yes. an immediate threat. You know, she could have said of, he snores too loudly. Yeah. You know, I can't take it anymore. And, no, <laughs> right. No, that wouldn't have worked. That wouldn't have been a good defense. I loved also in your book, I love the, the study of the community and the idea of these clusters of the community, the farm clusters, and who lived where, and where the son lived, and where the where who she went to for help, and and how they they reacted to her. But this this sense of community, which is in a way endearing, um, but in another way worked against her completely. And in Lizzie Borden's case the community rallied around her, mostly. She became a cause celeb for all manner of women's issues at the trial. She had Mary Liverworth there. She had women's suffrage people there. She had her uh, 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 temperance people there. She, She had a lot of support and women attended the trial. Now, was that the case also with this, the Hasek case where women interested or allowed in? Yes. And in fact, there were at least as many women as there were men. And there were women who, she was in jail on Easter before her trial. And there were women who walked in flocks as if hoping to get a view of her um, by the jail. I mean, she had not yet been sent to prison because she was had just been, you know, it was before the trial. But women were certainly in evidence at the trial. You know, it's interesting because most of the witnesses were men. There were women who claimed that said very little at the trial when they were called, um, that they knew that she had been in trouble. Um, They had heard her ask for help. But of course, Margaret hadn't gone to the women as much because she knew there was nothing that they could do. Um, I think it is interesting thinking about those clusters of farm families. And I think that each of them, each of those families was isolated in a way, but again, the men came together. together. Yes, yes. In town. Yes. Right. And I think that one of the things that happened to the men, or certainly was going on with the men, was that they didn't want to admit that their 
wives or daughters were capable of violence. I mean, I yes, think they yes, that was real strong in the Lizzie case too. They just, right. That how could your daughter be capable of or how doing could your maid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think that, you know, if, if Margaret Hasek could be guilty of murdering her husband, what might what my wife? Exactly. And, and I, I, I think that's part of the reason they insisted that she reconcile and go back home. Um, they didn't want to believe that a family, you know, that they're women could be oppressed in the way right there was no such were. thing as oppression of women there was no, such no. Thing. you were just in a bad mood right exactly yeah yeah and you know the fact that men had the power and dominated the family was accepted right and for a woman to revolt against that in such a violent way especially or even to argue to, to complain to her right. neighbors. That was a big deal. That was a big, a deal. very big deal. That took a lot of courage for her to uh, break that code of silence within the family to say that this is happening. And then to be set to be told, well, you need to figure this out yourself. You know, you guys need to work this out. It's just, she must have felt such despair. Right. I think the men did as they said at the trial, and there, a few of them admitted that they had known that John, I mean, right, they right. knew from her, they knew he had a bad temper. Um, they knew he could be a different man at home than he was in town. But as they said, what, what could they do? I mean, they, putting him in, a, in an insane asylum was unthinkable and even reprimanding him I mean, that was not the kind of was thing. It, that, it, it wasn't really against the law to hit your wife, was it? No, it wasn't. And for a man to interfere um, wasn't the kind of thing that was done either. No. Whether he was threatening his wife or his children. And that's the, the perfection of trifles, which is the story told through the women. It's exactly. the story of a woman told through the women with the men hovering around looking for evidence, going upstairs and downstairs and investigating. And the women are understanding her position in the family, her circumstances in this marriage, and the possibility of her being guilty, but why? And they get it. And when they get it, we get it. Right. So she's an entirely sympathetic character, even if she is guilty, even if. Whereas with Lizzie's case, she was not at all that sympathetic character when she was um, when she was uh, acquitted. In fact, the community turned against her. Because in Fall River, a very provincial town, she was um, shunned because she was tainted by the experience of being accused of being a murderer. So it wasn't so much that they all of a sudden thought she did it. It was all of a sudden they said, ew, she was on trial for murder. So she's not somebody that we can associate with. She's not one of us anymore. So she became the other in her own community. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elizabeth Hasek, after, after it was all over, stayed there. Lizzie, Margaret. Yeah, Margaret, I'm sorry, yes. Margaret stayed there. Oh, Lizzie Borden stayed there. You know, they stayed in the town that the murders happened in, in, in a way to hold their heads up a little bit high, to say, why aren't they looking for someone else? And I didn't do it. And I've got nothing to be ashamed about. Do, do you think that people in Fall River decided that Lizzie Borden had done it? That there were At no the time? Other... No, okay, no. Afterwards, no, they... afterwards. No, they do now. Uh -huh. Because there's all these modern, these modern uh, interpretations of the past 
which is where people mess up, in my opinion. The glory of your book is that it's an historical analysis of an historical event with the understanding the way it was then. So we're not placing some kind of modern interpretation on behaviors, actions, motives. We're not trying to find something that wasn't there because we need to demonize the victims. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Lizzie Borden case, all manner of odd, odd ideas have come forth in order to justify her getting away with it. In other words, there's the incest theory, which has no evidence. There is the lesbianism, which is what broke up her family. And I mean, even movies are made of such ridiculous ideas. And so it's a sort of a modern understanding of how people might behave today and then throwing that onto her back then, which is so unfair because she lived in another era. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 for instance, the maid being called Maggie by Lizzie and Emma, and yet Andrew and Abby called her Bridget by her first name. And people today say, oh, how rude that they called her Maggie when that was not her name. That is such a, that's so demeaning. And no, it wasn't because according to the Fall River Historical Society, back then Irish maids were called Maggie's. That was how they were referred to in the family. So them referring to her as Maggie was not a pejorative and neither did Bridget think of it that way. And in fact, they asked Bridget about that and she said it didn't bother her. So yeah. what we know as a 21st century person cannot, we have to scrape off all of our, our modern understandings and we have to allow the history to speak for itself and the people to live in their own era because it was different than mm -hmm in every way, even the idea, as you point out in the book, male juries. And, and, and one of the questions I was gonna ask you was about, does the play by Glasgow still resonate when we realize that it's all male jury and that, that those things don't exist anymore? But I think in my mind, it certainly does because it was the way it was. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting what you say about Lizzie and how people view it with a contemporary lens. Yes, yes. And I think one of the brilliant things that Glasgow does is to change the focus away from whether Minnie Wright did it or not. Um, in yes. fact, she suggests yes. that she did do it, but she doesn't want that to be the focus. Right. And it's I not a who done it. Right. It's not who done it. It's who is capable of judging her. Right. And who yes. is paying attention to yes. her life. And are there other questions of culpability? You know, what was the husband's role? What was the community's role? Why didn't anyone help her? Um, why was she so isolated, even though people could have known what she was going through? And that's not something the men consider. And in fact, it's not something that the legal system really considers. No, no, no. Now, it's sort of, yeah. I mean, that's why my law students, that's one of the things we talk about. Can the legal system really consider questions um, that go beyond who done it? But I think Glaspell really shows or suggests strongly to the audience that what we need to think about is something that's much broader than did she wield the ax or not? I think in answer to your question about is it relevant or why is it important to read today? I think it really goes beyond men and women. I think some uh -huh. people read it and think, oh, women have a different way of understanding than men do. I, I think you can see it in a broader interpretation.
that it really has to do with how do we understand the experiences of other people? Yes, and yes, it, yes. You know, yes. if the experience is foreign to us, yes. and of course, this happens with all kind of, you know, race, ethnicities, yep. people who are in poverty, mm -hmm. we don't really know what their lived experience is unless we listen to their stories, um, we are aware of our own biases and stereotypes mm -hmm. um, and, and try to understand what it would be like to what, you know, step into their shoes, have empathy for people. And I think that is something that Susan Glasspool really um, suggests. I think she achieved it. I actually think she achieved it. I think it's yeah. a perfect little play. I just, I, I, just a perfect little play. And I, I knew had, when I first read it when I was in college, I, I, rem I knew that it was a true crime event, right? but I didn't know which true crime it was. And it wasn't until much later that it was, I was made aware what it was. And it, the, the, it's, it's a fascinating story. When people ask me, what do you think? Did you, do you think Lizzie did it? And I say to them, and I'm not being snarky, <laughs> or uh, or trying to uh, sub t tweet them or whatever. I'm they, I say I don't know and I don't care. Yeah, because it doesn't matter. We'll never know. Right. And I'm not going to stand here and bes and demonize the victims, and neither am I going to demonize her because I'm not her and I don't know what she was going through and I can't imagine her existence from where I am today. Right. So I, because she was acquitted, I'm not gonna say, oh, well, therefore she's not guilty, but I will say I'm not, I don't know and I'll never be able to prove it. So why bother thinking in that direction? Let's look at, the community. Let's look at the social milieu. Let's look at class. Let's look at women's issues. Let's look at the history of the city. Let's look at the family dynamics. Let's look at other things and stop trying to solve the unsolvable. I so agree with you in the you know, when we started our work into the Hasek murder, I think Tom and I, well, I wrote the article first. I did hope I could solve it, you know, in we all do. I did the same thing. Exactly. Right. I'm going to be the one. Right. 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 Yeah. I'll read all of the records and I'll find out, you know, right. I'll find out which, but it soon became clear that we weren't going to, there was no smoking gun. And gradually, I think we realized just what you're saying, Stephanie, that what is interesting is the story of the community, the justice system, the yes. lawyers, yes. how she lived her life. And I, again, I think that's what Susan Glasgow, by taking our focus away yes. from did she do it or not, so brilliantly raises the question of what her life was like, whether the legal system addresses the right questions. Um, I felt in the Lizzie boarding case, they never, ever asked the right questions. They never asked the follow up. They never they let discrepancies lay there and didn't clean anything up with further inquiries or cross examinations. And I'm screaming at a trial transcript <laughs> saying, why didn't you ask this question? It's so obvious to me. Yeah. But again, we'll never know. We'll never know. Yeah, what and I think. Is. I think in reading the testimony in the Lizzie Borden case, and especially the arguments of the lawyers, right. it's so clearly, and Margaret Hasek's trial is the same, so clearly plays to the stereotypes of yep. the jury. And you know, both sides are trying to, to, to paint the defendant either as a true woman or as a fiend. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one or the other other and they're relying and i think that happens in courts today whether it's an immigrant or an african-american or you know a gay person 
relying on stereotypes is a common um it's a cop out really it's a cop out for lack of empathy or a lack of consideration of people who live differently than you and have different experiences there's a tv show that i watched that i have to throw in here i've been i've been binging it lately which is called evil lives here oh i don't know it and what they do is they go into the, it starts with a person and the person is either the daughter the brother the husband the wife the sister of the evil person and it's their story it's their story of growing up with this person it's their hmm. story of being abused by this husband it's their story of what they remember of them as children and then what happens and what and the kinds of signs that were there along the way that nobody took advantage of and nobody understood and it can and there everybody who's on the show is the relative in some way or married to a murderer so it's you're really forced into their lives in a brand new way from the outside in but from the inside out so mm. it's not the story of the murder it's the story of the effect of the murder on the family and it's so powerful and so well done they're shown photographs oh and like they, they you know this person who grows up to be a heinous serial killer and they showed a picture of them. Oh, I remember when he was four. Look how cute he was, you know? And they can go back to that moment and that memory of before and then follow it as this person grows up and becomes this monster. And I think that that's a perfect training for the person, the historian, mm. to understand the story from inside the family not from outside looking in. You'll never get there from that direction. And from only focusing on that one event. Right. You know, that who done it. Did right. did she or did she not? Yes. I mean, I think that's a really interesting. I want to know why, but I don't want to know who. I don't need to know who. Right. And I think, again, studying the family dynamics is certainly we found that in the Hase case, studying the family dynamics and the community dynamics and what the effect and the enduring impact is really one of the most interesting aspects. And of course, that you also have to see based on the times, you know, in light of what was happening then and not what would happen now. Um, and Margaret, so, Margaret Hasek was an ordinary person in her day. She didn't keep a diary, right? She unfortunately, didn't, no, right? right? She didn't, she, her family was not prominent. She wasn't wealthy. She wasn't in the newspapers all the time. People didn't know her whereabouts at all times. The same thing with Lizzie. She was just an ordinary person in an ordinary life. And then an extraordinary thing happened. Right. And they became the center of the universe for a while. And stayed there pretty much until they died. And still people talk about them and write books about them. And it endures, which is a word that you used earlier, that it endures. But you've got a new book out coming out. I oh, want to hear about that. It's yeah. called The The Plea. Tell the us plea. about the plea. Right. Um, it's thank you for asking. Oh, I, I can't wait to read it. Are you kidding? <laughs> Coming out in July, okay, this July from the University of Iowa Press. It is another true crime. Um, this one earlier, it happened in 1889. It's also a very gruesome murder. Um, a 12-year-old boy, he was actually 11 at the time, um, who was convicted of murdering his father and his stepmother oh my goodness in a particularly violent way shot his father in and then there were no other suspects he never um claimed that he did not do it he was only 11 years old at the time but his father was shot through the head um and then beaten and his stepmother was also beaten beaten to death 
he, as I say, did not claim that he did not do it. Um, he was, he didn't go to trial. He pled guilty at the advice of his lawyer. As you can imagine, the community stood firmly. I mean, they saw him as an evil child, um, someone who must have been born a monster. Um, and even though he didn't look it, um, they blamed him for depravity. Um, and it came out, he was sentenced to prison. He was Is there- Is this America? Is this yeah, the United States? It, was, oh. it was also in Iowa. Oh, okay. okay. Iowa, small town in Iowa, um, very isolated farm. Um, he was sent to Anamosa, which is interesting because it was the same place where Margaret Hasek was for a year. They did overlap, no evidence that they ever knew each other. She was in the women's ward, of course. Right, right. Um, he was the youngest prisoner there. He stayed there for 10 years and prisons were very different then. Um, the wardens took a real interest in the prisoners and were very rehabilitation was very yeah important. focused yes. on rehabilitation and, and Christian was, lifestyle yes. You know, yes yes and they believed that yes. prisoners could be rehabilitated and could be reformed and taught to live upstanding lives and they believed this about this young boy and they assigned him to the library it turned out that he was very intelligent he read widely he educated himself he pleaded the name of our book, The Plea. He wrote letters asking to be released, asking to be pardoned. Eventually, well-respected men in Iowa who visited him took up his cause. And part of what the focus of our book is, um, is the controversy that went on throughout Iowa, and especially in the state legislature, about whether he should be freed or not right you know there were all kinds of theories about criminality then you know, right went from you know if you phrenology had, yeah. yeah phrenology exactly yeah. Yeah. um and you know could a young boy who had committed such a violent crime um was he damned forever um would he commit other crimes when he got out, you know, did he have the murder instinct, as some people claimed, or was it possible that he could be reformed and rehabilitated and live a life as a normal citizen? Um, it, it, Susan Glaspell actually wrote a story about this young boy also. It's not a well-known one. In the Face of His Constituents is the name of it. And it's the story of a legislator who hears the arguments is very against pardon, but then hears the arguments in favor of the pardon and empathizes. You know, it, it is again about empathy, Glasswell's interest in empathizing and trying to understand the life of another person. Wesley Elkins is eventually pardoned. We were lucky because we had access to the letters that he was required to write to the governor every month for 10 years before oh, wow. he departed. So we're able to tell the story of his life afterwards, which, you know, he does become a, a upstanding citizen. He, he marries late in life, never has children, um, but he lives a very quiet life, eventually moves to Hawaii after he has lived in Iowa for his required 10 years, supports his sister, stepsister, his stepfather, um, a young blind stepbrother, buys a house, eventually moves to Hawaii, marries, um, becomes a chicken farmer in California. <laughs> you know, there's a sense of is there a criminal in instinct? Right. You know, once you commit a crime, does that define you forever? In this case, where he's such a young boy and his brain isn't even completely formed, exactly. which, but that's a modern understanding of the way, you know, his, of, of development, you know, cranial development and, and neurological development, right? Y yes, but it's, 
at that time, there, there was the child saving movement, for instance, that was developing new theories of crime, you know, that came out of social conditions and oh, um, that's right. That's right. Age, age was a very determining factor. And I will say, without disclosing too much, there is new evidence that comes out ooh, ooh, uh, ooh, ooh, about, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> about what his life was like. I mean, you had um, me just at the beginning of the story. Now I'm yeah. like, ooh, 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 ooh. so you're well, writing this with your husband? Is he yes, your husband? I am. Okay, Once and you wrote you the other book with your husband as well, The Midnight Assassin, which is available at midnightassassin.com, where you can look at all the photographs and the information about Susan Glassbill, as I recall. Yes. But what's it like to co-author two books with the same person? Or you obviously with, work well together or you wouldn't do it. With a spouse, yeah. right? <laughs> I think it probably makes it more difficult with a spouse. Um, it, I think it took us a lot longer because we were co-writing it. I think eventually it made it a, a better book. We certainly came at it from different directions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom, you know, is a writer. Um, he has more of a, what skill at narrative. I think okay. I okay. am a lawyer. Um, I'm much more analytical. I want, I am insistent that we be true to the facts that we not speculate. Um, and that we, everything that we say is based on evidence i mean you know as much as will, you can right as much i mean we, yeah. we do it, it is literary nonfiction, so we do say the horses you know um trotted along well we don't know for sure that they didn't walk slowly but you know <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> we can put it in you the know, birds in, were singing yeah it, well we don't know but it was well, spring, I will so say, chances are <laughs> yeah. you know one little disagreement we had was we were describing the thanksgiving dinner and tom wrote um the women were in the kitchen cooking the dinner and i said well we don't know that for sure probably they were right. but that's something a historian you know we don't know so we did have disagreements about that. Um, I think we worked it out well. Um, you didn't write a chapter and he read a chapter and you read a chapter and he read it. No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I wrote a chapter. He edited it. He gave it back to me. I put some of it back to what I had written. Initially. <laughs> you know, you can imagine. Now I see why that. it took a while. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We eventually were able to agree. It took a long time. But I think that coming at it from two different directions really made it a better book. And this um, is another Glassbell short story. So is again, again, did you come at it from Glassbell? Is that how you know? Not this no, one. no. That's uh, the way we came at this was we were visiting the Anamosa Penitentiary because of Margaret Hasek. Um, and we wanted to see where she had been imprisoned. While we were there, we talked a lot to um, two men who worked at the prison. And they said, well, there's another interesting story. Oh, that, cool. And so he, they told us the story of Wesley Elkins. We found out such a coincidence that Susan Glassville had written a story about Wesley Well, Elkins. that's just freaky, freaky. Isn't that? Yeah. But, you know, she was... She was a reporter. She didn't yeah. report on this story, but she was interested in cases yeah. at the time. And the whole debate about Wesley went on after she had left her journalistic post with the Des Moines Daily News, but clearly she followed it. So in a way, and this is an Iowa case, and she was living in Iowa. Mm -hmm. It was very controversial at the time, especially with this new evidence coming out. Um, so it's not, we did not know that, but as we found out about it, it's not totally surprising. Right. Uh, that she would write. Yeah, but it's you but, just gotta go, oh, jackpot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How could we be so lucky? Um, so it is it I it comes out the plea yes. is the name of the book. It comes out from the University Show of us Iowa. The cover again. Will you have a website also for this book? 
Well, if you go to the Midnight Assassin, www.midnightassassin.com, we do have information about the plea. Um, and we, so it- I will pre-order it today. Please. I and will. You can, you can do it on the Midnight Assassin website. I would, um, and it sounds like an amazing, another amazing book by you guys. You're, it's not just the content of your books. You guys have a very good writing style. It's very consumable for a book that's published by a university press, I might say. So um, it's thank not you, stodgy. It is quite, you. Uh, quite uh, and I must admit that when I read Midnight Assassin, I was like, a third of the way in, I was like, I know who did it. Like, that was the way I felt about it. And it took until the very end on page, uh, what, 246 somewhere, where somebody actually starts saying, well, wait a minute, we think somebody else did it. And they start naming names. And I'm thinking, yes, <laughs> you know, that's my little thing. But the story itself is so riveting and so interesting and so uh, full of pathos that it's a great story that you told and the combination of it with connection with the theater, which is my area with Susan yeah. Glassville just adds an immense amount of interest on my part. And so, yes, thank you very, very much for writing the book and also for appearing on the podcast today. It's very informative. And oh, thank you, Stephanie. It has been a real pleasure for me. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 15. Find Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can sign up for our free newsletter, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and listen to more Lizzie Borden Podcasts on our website or on Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube.